welcome to Calvary Chapel Online. My name is Kelly, and I'm so glad that we get to be together this weekend. Now, if you're joining Calvary for the first time or checking out church for the first time, we would love to connect with you. All you have to do is text the word NEW to 31352 or visit the website that's on the screen below. Now, before we start our service, I want to let you know about a few things that may help you. First, if you have kids in your house today, we would love for you to check out the content that we have for their age group. We're putting out content every week just for your kids, and those links are going up on the screen right now. So write those down and make sure you let your kids know that there's something just for them. Also, something else we want you to know is that you can follow along with our service through teaching points, scripture, and additional content by going to the YouVersion Bible app on your phone. All you do is click the More tab and check out Events. Search Calvary Chapel Fort Lauderdale, and there you can follow along with Pastor Doug as he teaches the weekend message. We also want to remind you that if you need prayer for any reason at all, all you have to do is call the number on the screen below. We have a team that's waiting for your call. They would love to talk with you, encourage you, and pray for you. So don't hesitate. Call whenever. That number is on the screen. And this weekend, we are starting a new teaching series. We're going to be in the book of Genesis, so go ahead and open up now to Genesis chapter 25. We're going to get ready for worship, so get comfortable and let's worship together. Hey, welcome back, everybody. So happy you're joining us today. Psalm 71 8 says this it says that your praise and honor are in my mouth all the day long. So we're going to ask the Lord to fill our mouth with praise and we're going to tell him how good he is. You ready for that? All right, here we go. Sing that praise. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory, oh, let it rise, let praise arise, here we go, we'll see you break down every wall, we'll watch the giants fall, you cannot survive. Inside of me, oh, let it rise, let faith arise. Yeah. We'll see you break down every wall, we'll watch the giants fall. You cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on us. We sing it. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. And this is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Come on, we sing it. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. We cannot survive when we praise. 
I will rest, I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will
Yes, Father, we come to you in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus. We come to you with full assurance because we know you say in your word that perfect love casts out fear and that we come to you with boldness before your throne of grace. Here we are today before your throne of grace, our God. We speak to the mountains in the way that our God is a way maker, that you pose no threat to the will of our God. 
We speak to the impossibilities. He is a miracle worker. We speak to the uncertainty of tomorrow and say, God, you are a promise keeper. So we will not be afraid, but we walk forward in boldness, knowing who you are. You are good and your ways are always good. So we ask, even when we don't see it and don't feel it, would you fix our eyes and our heart on the one who never changes, the Lord God Almighty, Yahweh, our King. We give you all the glory and honor and praise. And we pray in agreement, unified, across cities, unified in one heart, under the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Hi, and welcome to Calvary Chapel Online. We are so glad that you have joined us for our Memorial Day weekend. Today, we wanna to remember those who have fought for our freedom and safety through the years. This weekend, it's our heart to honor them. We also want to say a sincere thank you to everyone who has supported a loved one, who has sacrificially defended our health and safety. Now, for many of us, Memorial Day weekend is a time of reflection, but it's also a time to celebrate the unofficial beginning of summer. And while summer may look a little different this year, you can still make it the best summer yet. You can meet new friends and discover how life is actually better together. Doesn't that sound good? Sounds great. Then what do you do? You wanna join a summer group. And the way you do that is you go to joinagroup.org. That's it. That's it. And here's another summer highlight. This weekend, we're excited to get back into part three of an intriguing summer teaching series through the book of Genesis. It's called Origins Part Three, The Dreamers. We think that you're gonna be inspired. So we hope that you join us on this continued journey through Genesis this summer. That's all for now. But remember, you can still find out so much more at calvaryftl.org. Bye. See you next weekend. In the beginning, a perfect system was designed, a flawless order created, but something went wrong. Man fell into a slumber, sin shut his eyes, disease and death pervaded, and the nightmare began. very beginning, redemption had a plan, speaking through our dreams, a vision of hope to man, to break the grip of the oppressor, to set the captives free, to open the eyes of the dreamer to the things we cannot see. Awake, O oh sleeper, arise, you dreamers, when it seems our dreams have died. He brings a new thing to life. Hey, Calvary family. We are so grateful you are joining us as we kick off our new series, Origins 3. So if you have a Bible, Genesis 25, as you gather again around your television screen, your computer, you're in your car, you're on your back porch with family, roommates, friends. Again, we know the church is not a building, it's a people, so it's, it's our pleasure to meet with you uh, this weekend. We also want to let you know with all the questions about what, what's going to happen next and re-emerging, I heard everything's opening back up again, what's happening at Calvary? Well, we want to share all those details with you this coming Wednesday, May 27th. It's our regular scheduled Wednesday night service, and we're going to share with you details of what that opening looks like. It's not going to be a switch that just flips like this. It's going to be a gradual reopening about how can we gather together in ways that are safe. Right now, we hope you're gathering in groups, either virtually or now we're gathering in groups of 10, and you're able to sit and talk about what God is teaching us through his word. But we're so excited to jump back into the book of Genesis chapter 25, to see what happens in the legacy of Abraham. So let's pray together and ask God to prepare our hearts. Father, we thank you that even though this COVID thing has lasted longer than we thought, there are some deep and beautiful lessons you're teaching us in this moment. And as we look into your word and we see the way you use disappointment and grief and heartache and even death for a greater purpose, that there's hope beyond grief. There's hope beyond the grave. So God, I know 
There's so many of us that are looking for hope. I, I pray for those that are just maybe watching for the first time, that you would give them a deep sense of hope they can only find in you. They would find you today. So teach us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So if, if you're new to the Bible, the Bible is really the story of, of us. It's the story of our creation. The book of Genesis is about beginnings. That's why we call the series Origins. It's where we came from, why God made us, what is our purpose. And we see in the beginning in Genesis 1 that God made a world that it was good, that was very good. He gave Adam and Eve the, the crown of his creation, an open canvas. Go and multiply, fill the earth, co-create with me. Name the animals, till the ground, explore. I mean, it was a beautiful world until Adam and Eve, given this gift of free will, chose to disobey and rebel against their creator. And then sin entered the world and death entered the world. And now we see this downward spiral that explains so much of our world today. We see so much beauty in the world, and yet so much heartache. And it's hard for us to reconcile these two things. Genesis describes for us this flood that God brings. And then God, he's going to start over with one man, with one family. And all the hopes and dreams of all humanity are going to rest on this man, Abram, who's later renamed Abraham, the father of faith. And we, we watched his journey when we went through Origins 2, this great promise that God had given to this one man. And Abraham's journey was to leave his home and his family and his business and go on this journey of faith and he would walk at night under the stars and God would say, I'm going to give you as many descendants as the stars, the sky, yet you have no children. And I'm going to give you this promised land, yet there's a famine. And there's this promise that's conflicting with reality. And he's like, is, is this really real? But Abraham, he, he is our father of faith. He never gave up on the dream that God had given him. And at the end of his life, he is called the friend of God. And I don't know about you, but if I, if I think about the legacy I want to leave in my life, I, I hope that people will say, you know, Doug, he, he was the friend of God. And at the end of Abraham's life, it's like Abraham and God are seated on this porch on a rocking chair, just talking about this journey of life they, they've taken together. And then, well, we closed out Origins last summer with this line, Genesis 25, 9. Then Abraham breathed his last and died. At a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre. So maybe you're asking, was that, is that it? Like the father of faith dies? Is that the end of the dream, the promise? No, but before we move on to the hope that is beyond grief, we need to pause. Because sometimes we just need to pause in our grief. And, and this is a season of time where there's so much to grieve. There have been so many losses. And sometimes we just sort of jump over all the losses and say, let's go on to hope. Let's, let's smile. Let's put, a, let's put a smile on. Let's get, let's get happy again. But there's something beautiful about what the Bible does when an icon of faith passes away. There's this sense of pause. Isaac and Ishmael, who've been at war with each other, they come together to bury their father. So let's just stop and reflect for a moment. What are some of those things that we lost? I mean, we think of the hundreds of people who couldn't even have memorial services during COVID because they couldn't gather with more than 10 people. And we got together with churches all across this region, and we did uh, one in Miami-Dade and one here in Broward County where we could just grieve the loss of people who have passed. But we also think this week of just a moment to reflect on Ravi Zacharias. He He's this brilliant mind, this father of our faith, much like, like a Billy Graham who traveled the world and shared the gospel. Again, a brilliant mind, but just such a, a spacious heart, just a, such, a, such a way to love. And, and the Christian community is experiencing such a loss, this beloved uncle of our faith. We see the death of Ahmaud Arbery, a 25-year-old young man who goes out for a jog and is killed in such a senseless way that it sort of makes you scratch your head and and some people might say, well, that's just one life, and there are thousands of people that die, but, but this brings out this deep brokenness in our history. It's something we have to mourn and grieve. We have to pause and say, maybe as a, as a white man or a white woman, I don't understand what my brown and black brothers and sisters have, have dealt with because of the 250 years of slavery in our country and the 100 years of just 
marginalization systematically in our country. And, and we just need to take a moment and just grieve that and say that these moments bring up all that history into our present. And it's disorienting. We look at Ravi Zacharias. We look at Ahmaud Arbery. We look at a man named Darren Patrick, a pastor who's very well known in the Christian community who, who died of a, a self-inflicted gunshot wound. We start thinking about all the, the pressures that have happened, even during COVID. What, what happens during isolation? What happens when mental health issues and, and pressure sort of collides? And, and maybe you're here and you're like, I'm, I've got so much grief and I've got so much mourning right now, I don't even know how to take the next step. And we just want to say to you, in your mourning, in your grief, that, that you, you are not alone. And that the suicide is, is not an option. It, it's not an option for you. It's not going to take away your pain. It's going to multiply pain. And that you shouldn't believe the lie that says, maybe it would be better if I was never born. That you should not believe the lie. That no one cares. That if your life was over, if you took care of life, no one would even notice. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God has a good plan for your life. He cares about you. And even right now, I mean, if you're in that place where you're like, I'm just looking for hope and maybe this is your last hope, then text a family member or friend. At the close of our service, call a phone number and just start to talk and you're going to find out that you're not alone. And, and here's the thing, you're not always going to feel the way you feel now. There is a hope beyond grief. And we want to just remind you that you're probably not, in fact, we know you're not listening to this by accident. We also think about uh, what today represents. Today is Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a, a day our nation sets apart to say we just need to stop and pause and remember and mourn the sacrifices of so many men and women who lay down their lives for our country. And so let's just for a moment pause. We can mourn the loss of those who struggle with mental illness. We can mourn the loss of those who, who died in, in, a, in a racially charged and motivated way. We can mourn the loss of spiritual fathers and mothers. We can mourn the loss of soldiers, of courageous men and women who've laid down their life. Let's take a moment and just remember. Sometimes the quiet, it makes us uncomfortable because we don't even know what to do with our mind. We start thinking about this and our mind trails over here and trails over here. But there's something about the, taking that pause and mourning that's important for our souls. And I want to share with you just as we look at the death of Abraham and the, and the closing of one chapter before we open the next chapter, we just need to take that moment because here's what we learn. Mourning teaches us what we can't learn in celebration. This, this loss and grief, it causes us to listen and hopefully it creates in us this type of empathy. I wonder what it's like to struggle with mental illness. I've ne I, never, I never have. I wonder what it's like to be racially profiled. That's, that's never happened to me. I wonder what it would be like to be a soldier, to be willing to lay down my life and, and people almost disregard that sacrifice like it's not even a big deal. I wonder what it's like to be a spiritual father and leave this legacy. I wonder in mourning, it, it, it makes us quiet. It makes us reflective. It's, it's part of the necessary process of life. Solomon writes this, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting for death is the destiny of everyone and the living should take this to heart. Then he says this, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. And maybe like if you're, watching with your grandfather or grandmother, or your, your mom or dad, you can sort of just ask them the question. For people who are older, what, what has loss taught you in life? What have you learned through mourning and grief that you haven't learned at the party, at the celebration? And especially for those grandmothers and grandfathers who could reflect back on World War II or the Korean War, or the Vietnam War, or they can, they can talk about the Depression or the Recession. They can talk about the times where they didn't know how they were going to pay their bills, and there was just one little piece of bread left to eat, and 
There's so much there for us. And the generations that follow to say, man, when there's loss and there's hardship and there's mourning, there's so much for us to learn in this moment. Maybe in your groups this week, this is the discussion you have. What have we learned from loss in our lives? And so as we think about COVID, we're asking some of these questions. Man, we've lost so much. Maybe you've lost a job again. Maybe you've had to move. Maybe everything in your world is just disrupted. And you're asking, will it ever be the same? <laughs> will, will we ever be able to go back to normal? And there's something in that waiting period, because waiting is always the hardest part where God is saying, in your waiting, with your questions, with your grief, as you process, draw near to me. James, the brother of Jesus, writes this, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Because God, in a beautiful way, is with us while we wait. He says, if you're broken and contrite in spirit, I'll bring you comfort. He says to Paul the Apostle, in your weakness, I will make you strong. And so Abraham dies. And even his death, he brings two sons who are at war with each other back together again. And this is, again, the beauty of, of death. It causes us to put down our weapons and to listen with empathy to the other and celebrate what God has done through those fathers and mothers of faith. And so it brings us to our next idea. And that's this, that you can never go back, but you can go forward. Yeah, you can't change the past, but you can change the future. That we, as God's people, don't have to live the coulda, shoulda, woulda life. You know, that's a song some people sing. I coulda, I shoulda, I woulda. If I knew COVID was coming, I would have done this in February. I would have done this in January. I don't know if you've ever been uh, a new driver and you're driving and you get a ticket because you're speeding, you're driving too fast. That never happened to me, uh, but I have friends that that happened to. No, I'm just kidding. It happened to me many times. And I kept thinking to myself, if I would have left five minutes earlier or five minutes later, then I wouldn't have got that ticket. I wouldn't have gotten that car crash. If I would have done this or that, and what we do when we do that is we, we, we almost put ourselves in the place of God. If I knew everything, then I would act different. But that's not how life is. To try to go back and, and beat ourselves up about the past is only going to keep us stuck. But if we can say, how do I learn from what, what happened? How do, I, how do I process these things well? I can move forward because if you process loss and grief well, there's a wholeness you can bring into the future that will change your future and your life. Again, that's why we're, we're going to gather together the, this coming Wednesday and just talk about what have we learned and where are we going as a church. It's not just about what's the date we reopen church gatherings, but, but what is God teaching us about reaching our community and changing our world, our vision, our mission to make disciples and how we do that. And he's showing us things that are going to help us reach more people with the love of Jesus. And we're excited about what he's doing in this time, in this moment of great disruption. And so Isaac is going to take his father's place. As God appeared to Abraham and gave him dreams, now God appears to Isaac and gives him dreams. And it's the craziest thing when you read the story in Genesis 25 and 26. There's some identical language. I mean, God promises Abraham and Isaac they're going to have this promised land, and they both experience a famine. He tells them they're both going to have children and they both experience infertility. Isaac is going to experience 20 years of not being able to have a baby with his wife, Rebecca. They're both going to be put in situations where they compromise and lie. They're both going to be in situations where even out of that lie, God redeems them and still blesses them. They're both going to set up tents. They're both going to create altars. They're both going to burn incense and pray to God. I mean, almost identical language. And in chapter 26, God appears to Isaac in almost identical way, he appeared to Abraham and he says this to the son who's going to take on this legacy and be the next dreamer. That night, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Now do not be afraid for I am with you. And I will bless you and increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. So Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. Isaac is his own man. Isaac is seeking God for himself. It's not his father's faith anymore. And if, if you're a young person sitting with your mom and dad, there's going to come a time where mom and dad are not going to be there to say, hey, did you read the Bible today? 
Did you pray today? Have you given generously? Have you found a way to serve someone else? And, and you're going to have to decide when, when mom and dad aren't around and I'm at college or they've passed away and I'm my own man or my own woman, will I keep this faith for myself or was it just my parents' faith? And we're going to see as Isaac faces struggles, he doesn't do everything perfectly, he makes some of the same mistakes his dad makes, but he is one who is seeking to follow God. And we see this in Genesis chapter 25 and in verse 21. It says, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. And the Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. And the babies jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And this is a crazy part of the story, right? So they can't have kids for 20 years. And then the promise is that they're going to have a child that's going to keep on passing that legacy of faith along. And so after 20 years, she finally gets pregnant after Isaac prays. And then you notice that she also prays and inquires of God. So you see this beautiful pattern of Isaac learning from his dad. And now Rebecca, his wife, learning from Isaac. And they're, they're praying. And she asked this question that I think a lot of us have asked during COVID. Why is this happening to me? I don't know if you feel like you're at the end of your rope, like you're, at, you're in the COVID crazy you, you feel overwhelmed. Like I, I've talked to a lot of people who were doing great all through COVID and this week they hit a wall. They're like, I don't know what to think. I don't know what to feel. My mind is racing. I can't make decisions. I'm anxious. I haven't been sleeping. I, I, I just have to breathe. I had my first panic attack during COVID and, and this is starting to be that sustained place of like, I don't, I don't know what's up. I don't know how to juggle all these responsibilities. Adrenaline can only get you so far. And this is the place where Rebecca's at. She's like, you know, I've waited 20 years and now I have a wrestling match with these two children happening inside of me. And, and what happens? God tells her. The Lord says to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples are within you. They will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. And when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. The fight continues outside of the womb. And he was nicknamed Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Rebekah's like, I got pregnant. I, God finally answered my prayer. And she had a dream, an idea of how it was actually going to work out in her life. And you know, the that happens in life. We have sometimes an idea. We're in love with the idea of, I'm going to follow God, and he's going to give me a family, and I'm going to raise some kids, and it's going to be amazing. And then there's the reality. The reality of, why are my kids always fighting? Why don't I have all the answers? Why do I feel all this pressure? And we articulate this, this cry that Rebecca says, why is this happening? To me. And it's interesting when you look at this story, it's almost a, an exact reflection of Abraham. Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. One was a mama's boy and one was a daddy's boy. One was in the house and one was a fighter. And the same thing with Jacob and Esau. Jacob is going to be the mama's boy, the one who's grasping at his older brother's heel. Esau is going to be this red, hairy he man who's going to be hunting and fighting and he's going to be daddy's boy. There's going to be sibling rivalry. There's going to be favoritism. I mean, this, this family is going to echo the dysfunction of its former family, the one that raised Isaac. And sometimes from generation to generation, if we're not careful, we'll repeat those same mistakes. But here's the beautiful thing we see. In this very dysfunctional family, God is still going to work. Look at verse 27. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay home among the tents. And Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Favoritism, jealousy, preferential treatment. It's going to get passed on from generation to generation. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It's going to be rough going. But this is, or should be, very encouraging for you at home. If you're like, man, my family is like, shh, my family is like messed up. We got so many problems. Well, when you look in the pages of the Bible, you should feel like, you know what, I'm, I'm actually in good company. 
Godly families struggle. People trying to follow God, trying to follow Jesus, trying to do what's right, you're going to struggle. Isaac and Rebecca, they're going to struggle greatly. Jacob and Esau and their, their wives and kids, they're going to struggle greatly. But even in that loss, there is a deep sense of hope that God is weaving his story of hope even through all this dysfunction. And, you know, I just want to say as we think about grief and think about the things that happen to us, sometimes we can, we can own them more than we should. You see, it's not what happens in our life that affects our future as much as how we interpret those events. And we have to be careful when we go through hurts and disappointments that we don't process, God, this must mean you're against me. Or the way I'm feeling, I'm always going to feel that way. Or it's because of this person's fault that I'm stuck in this way. Now we see the people of faith, they can look beyond the grief and the loss and the disillusionment and the disappointment and say, but I know this is not what I, what I dreamed. But God, he has his plan. And so I want you to think real quick. Anybody here having problems at home? Anybody here, you're like, I hit the COVID crazy threshold. I, I'm, I hit a wall this week. Again, you're not alone. You're in good company. Whether it's an issue in your marriage, whether it's an issue with sibling rivalries, whether you're roommates, you're ready to kill your roommate right now because they've gotten on your last nerve. God actually wants to use that in their life and in your life for something beautiful. And, and so what, what we're going to watch now is as Jacob and Esau grow up, Jacob the mama's boy, Esau the daddy's boy, all the brokenness. Now it's time to pass on the birthright. And the, and the birthright is, is really a double portion of the inheritance. It's going to happen actually as Isaac passes away, but we're going to watch a bizarre scene of two brothers that are going to bargain over the birthright. Look at verse 29. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. And he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. And that is why he's called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. And you're like, what? The brother's going to use his other brother's hunger to negotiate the birthright? And look what Esau says. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now again, if, if you're not familiar with the Bible and the way it worked back in the day, the birthright said to the oldest son in the family, he would get the double inheritance. And we know Abraham and Isaac, they were very, very wealthy. So you can imagine millions and millions of dollars are on the line at this moment. And Esau is so hungry. Have you ever, have you ever had someone in your family say, I'm starving. I'm going to die right now if I don't eat. And how many times is that actually true? Yeah, almost never. When my kids say, I'm starving, I say, it takes 40 days to starve to death. You're probably actually not starving. You probably just have this strong need. I need, I want, I'm hungry. Whatever that thing is. Esau gives in to his appetites and sells his birthright. And it's not just the birthright of a double inheritance. It's also the spiritual legacy as the head of the family, which back in the day was one of the highest honors and privileges and responsibilities. And Esau is going to sell it in a moment. And that gives us kind of the foundation of our, our last point, which is don't trade what you want most for what you want now. Don't be the person who, who trades something eternal for something momentary. I mean, when I read the story, the first thing that stands out to me is the deceitfulness of Jacob. What kind of little conniving brother, what kind of punk would, would, would trick or manipulate his older brother into selling his birthright? But Jacob's his, his name means deceiver. He is the heel catcher. He's the one who, who wanted to get out of his mom's womb first to be the head. And he wanted that spiritual legacy, that spiritual mantle. But he pursued the right thing in the wrong way. If you ever utter the phrase, well, the ends justify the means. It doesn't matter how I get there. As long as I get there, then maybe, well, you're a lot like Jacob. And Jacob's going to go through a humbling process because even in his manipulation of his brother and in his father in the next chapter, he's going to lose so much of what he's actually hoping for. 
But the Bible actually focuses most of the guilt and most of the blame of this moment on Esau. Because Esau was sort of apathetic. (laughs) I don't care. I don't care about the birthright. I don't care about money. I don't care about the responsibility to be the head of the family. I mean, think about what he traded. It could have been, this is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Esau for all generations. And he traded it for a single meal. I mean, Hebrews 12, 16 says, godless Esau traded this legacy for one single meal meal. And how many times in our lives has there been something that was like right there and you don't realize like I'm, I'm one click away from destroying my legacy or I, I, my body is craving this thing so bad. The lust of my eyes or my flesh want this thing so bad. And you don't ask yourself the question, what am I going to trade for this in this moment to satisfy that desire, that appetite? I mean, if, if, if Esau just would have asked the question, is, is this bowl of stew worth trading for my legacy? If he would have asked himself that question, he, he probably wouldn't have done it. But what isolation does, and Esau is always seen as this isolated person, is he's always in his own head thinking about what he wants for himself. I want that wife. I want that food. I want that lifestyle. I want to reject all this responsibility. I want to be my own person. And out of that, he just, he dishonors his family. And again, he's, He's called godless Esau. So if we place our hope on what is temporary and passing, then we're going to find that our satisfaction is temporary and passing. That's why the Bible says we should put our hope in things that are above, things that are eternal, things that will last. But Esau, he doesn't do that. And then as you think about your life, again, I know... For the number of people who are watching and joining us, there are some of you that are thinking right now about something that's, that seems so good and seems so right. But if you would stop and ask yourself, if I would just examine, is this now opportunity going to be a traded for something that's so much more important in my life? As people think about, you know, hey, maybe this is, the moment where my husband or wife is, they're not meeting my needs and I can find that uh, being met somewhere else. I see so many people that have this deep sense of regret. It's like the Esau moment. Once they realize, oh no, what did I trade? There's this deep sense of sorrow and regret. I don't know if you've ever felt like Esau. And you just, you followed the appetite and then you have this deep sense of regret and shame. What did I do? This is why it's so important to live in community. That's why it's so important to, even this week in your group, to say, hey, these are the temptations that are sort of in my mind right now. And when you say them out loud in front of other people, it dissipates the temptation. It's something amazing. When we speak something in the light, it sort of kills that inner hidden desire where we get out of our own heads. And when we hear ourselves say it, we're like, yeah, that, <laughs> that does, not, does not sound right. But isolation makes us vulnerable. So again, we see this, Oldest son, strong, favorite of the father. In so many ways, he's going to be the one that takes the inheritance and the mantle and the spiritual leadership, and he just throws it away because he's apathetic about it. And we know that COVID has created a lot of apathy. As we get out of our rhythms, like, I don't feel like exercising today. I'm going to get some more Krispy Kreme. Or, you know what, I'm not going to read my Bible today because, you know, I don't know, what's the point? And praying, I mean, I've been praying and, Nothing's changed, and you're going to go through this process of, of apathy. Why, why should I get in a group? And you just sort of realize you're, you're stuck. And some of us have been stuck for eight, nine, ten weeks, and, and there's something that should snap us out of that apathy to say, wait a second. If apathy is one of those things that can keep us from the promises of God and, and hope, then I need to find a way back, a, a way of repentance. And so we see that the promise that's going to go from Abraham to Isaac is now going to go to Jacob. And we see that even through the family dysfunction and the brokenness, that, that hope is beyond the grief and the loss and all those things that are broken. And, and we get this beautiful promise in the New Testament about how hope works, even in 
difficult times. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. He says, you know, there's things in our life that are hard, sufferings, but even in our sufferings, even in COVID, even in all of the brokenness that's been revealed in our lives, there's this beautiful thing that comes out. Again, a hope that's beyond grief, that produces perseverance, a strength on the inside. And that strength on the inside creates a character that, that sustains us through all the temptations and all the distractions of life. And that creates this deep sense of hope that will not disappoint us because God pours his love into our hearts. This is such a beautiful picture of how God is not just working in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob's life, but in our lives today. And I just want to invite you to know that you can know this hope because though sin has entered the world, and though death has been the result of that sin, there is a hope that's beyond the grave because Jesus conquered sin and death and hell, and his grave is empty, and he now reigns in heaven as our Savior and our victor. And we want to pray and ask God to give us that sense of strength and victory in the deepest part of our souls because that type of hope will never disappoint us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that even in our brokenness, you are at work. We thank you that even in the ways that we disappoint ourselves, you can bring us back into repentance and redemption. We pray that even in the middle of a COVID crisis, you can be working deeper in your church. You can be spreading out the, the boundaries of our faith, reaching new people. And Father, I pray for anyone who's watching right now, listening to the sound of my voice, that you would draw them into that grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Hey, we want to offer a chance just to be community for you. And maybe as you heard this message, you're like, I, I need hope. Because I've been thinking about my own life and wishing it was over. Listen, there's someone you can call right now. You can call the number on the screen and just say, hey, this is how I feel. Can you pray for me? In this sort of in a beautiful, anonymous way, someone on the other line will pray for you. And don't be surprised if they don't say, you know what? I, I went through something like that myself a few years back. Here's what God taught me. Maybe you're in a, that place of fear. Maybe you've, you're, you're struggling with some of the injustices you've seen in the world. Maybe you're just feeling this deep sense of loss as you've watched other leaders maybe pass away. Maybe you have family that was in the military and Memorial Day weekend is just a hard day for you. We want to pray for you. But we also want to invite you to the, the hope that will be the anchor to your soul, a hope on the inside. Not just a hope that when you tune into a church service or read a Bible verse every once in a while, you feel better. No, we're talking about the knowledge that when you close your eyes in death, that you can go to heaven, a place of no more sorrow, no more pain, and no more tears. And there is a way to heaven. His name is Jesus. You see, the promise given to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob was out of their seed, they would have a descendant who would be the glory of Israel, the light to the Gentiles, the one who would bring us all back to God. His name is Jesus, a God, the God of heaven, who came down to earth, a God with skin on, who lived just like we lived and died in our place so that we could have eternal life. It was his mission. It was his passion. He did it because he loves you and he loves me. And if you right now know you need forgiveness. You, you want to find your way back. Get rid of that sense of regret and guilt and shame. You can just pray right now, God, I, I ask you to forgive my sin and to wash my heart clean and to come into my life. Jesus, I believe you died in my place and I want to follow you. And if you just prayed that prayer, even in your mind, or you want to pray that way, you can just text the word believe to 31352 or call someone again. We want to pray with you. We want to, we want to celebrate with you the first step on the greatest adventure of your life. And now, Calvary family, we want to close with a song. It's a song of worship. It's a song about how God takes a grave and turns it into a garden. You know, in our, our lives, we, we, we often do what Adam and Eve it does. We actually take a garden and turn it into a grave, but he always reverses that. He always takes death and turns it into life. And so as we close today, we want to sing again with all of our hearts to the God who gives us this hope beyond grief. Let's worship together. 
Hey, I wanna invite you to stand up with us. We're gonna celebrate the fact that only our God can take a mess and make it a miracle. So come on, join us as we sing. For I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Oh, then you came along And you put me back together and every desire is now satisfied right here in your love. I'll say nothing is better than you. Come on. For oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing. You turn crazy into 
everyone, thanks so much for joining us this weekend as we begun our new series, Origins, in Genesis 25. Now, we have put together a few questions just for you so that you can go into your groups this week, whether virtual or in person, and have things to discuss about this weekend's teaching. Those are on the screen now, but if you don't have a chance to get those right now, you can go to calvaryftl.org eConnection and sign up for those questions to be delivered to your inbox every week. So do that now. Again, these are questions that are going to come after every week in teaching. Also, we want to remind you and invite you for you to join us for our virtual family meeting that's happening this Wednesday, May 27th at 6.30 online. Pastor Doug will be sharing more about what our church is doing moving forward. And so we invite you to join us. We can't wait to see you there. We love you, church. We're praying for you and we'll see you on Wednesday.